Hmm. Yeah, it's streaming now. Now, it's, now it's working. Now All it's right. working. As a fisherman, I make my living on the coast. So when my son tell me about protecting the coast, I thought he was going to tell me to stop fishing. But I finally went to one of them meetings with heat and it opened my eyes. Terms like climate change, storm surge and beach erosion had me so confused. But Junior showed me that when we got a storm, we lose a bit more of the beach and how developers, locals, tourists and the fishing community all have to learn to use the coast without damaging the coast. If we don't do more to protect our coast, we could lose everything. Like Freddie and Junior, there are many who rely on our coast for their livelihood. The Coastal Zone Management Unit is working to sustainably manage our coastal spaces by mitigating the impacts of climate change for generations to come through updating the integrated Coastal Zone Management Plan. From monitoring beach levels, restoring mangroves and wetlands, to working with community leaders and private developers, the CZMU is planning for a safer and more resilient coast. See more of Freddie and Junior's story on the CZMU and GIS social media. Play your part to manage and protect our coast, our home, our future. To view the updated ICZM plan and learn more, visit coastal.gov.bb slash ICZM plan. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It is my pleasure to welcome you to the third of a series of meetings, which make up the public inquiry for the draft integrated coastal zone management plan. My name is Alison Wiggins, and I will be taking you through this evening's discussion. First of all, let me welcome our team here this evening. From the coastal zone management unit, we have the director, Dr. Leo Brewster, deputy director, Antonio Rowe, the project manager, Ricardo Arthur, the coastal information systems manager, Ramon Roach, our coastal planner, Fabian Hines, the marine biologist, Richard Suku, and our technical officer, Shamari Cave. The team from our consultants comprises of Raul Medina Santa Maria, Jonathan McHugh, Maria Marino, Heather Barker, and Renee Gibson. This evening's discussion will center on Siberia 3, which is from Concept Bay in, down to the choice in St. Peter. As you would know, as I mentioned, this particular sub area is basically the eastern boundary of the national park. So we therefore have plans and policies and guidelines, which will see us trying to preserve the ambience and the nature and the characteristics of the national park. Let me introduce the chairman of this public inquiry, Dr. Yolanda, uh, Yolanda Aline. She's no trace stranger to um, physical planning and environmental conservation here in Barbados. She will open this meeting with a few words. Dr. Aline. Good evening, everyone, and thank you very much, Alison. Welcome everyone to this, our third public consultation on the integrated coastal zone management plan. It is a very important document, a very important framework for managing our coastal management areas. And as many of you are aware, more than half of our population lives in the coastal zone or within a kilometer or so from the coastline. And our about 95% of the tourism infrastructure and much of our many of our business places are also located in this in this zone, this very intense zone of activity. And we also have many um activities in our marine space. So it's very difficult to manage our coastal areas in an island this size without recognizing the significance of the impacts of land-based activities from the upper reaches of the watershed all the way through to the coastline on the one hand, and that intense set of marine processes that are taking place on the other, on the other hand. So integrated coastal zone management is essential to Barbados as healthy oceans and coastal areas are vital to our economic future. This draft Integrated Coastal Zone Management Plan is timely. It's a timely intervention in the context of increasing climate and disaster risks and combined with our increased coastal development activity and intensive use of our marine areas. So now is the time for all of us to get involved in this process. 
we, the general public and key stakeholders are all custodians of our coast. And this consultation process is an opportunity for everyone to get involved. As Alison pointed out, we're looking at sub area three from Concept Bay to the choice. And it is the Eastern edge of our um, national park area, proposed national park area. So it is very important that we look at the kind of management guidelines that are set in place to improve the management of our coastal areas. So I would like you to pay close attention, um, take, get, get your thoughts together during the presentations and give meaningful feedback when it comes to the discussion session on how we can improve on our coastal zone management, how we can, or if you have alternative options, you can even comment on the structure of the report for those of you who read it to see whether the, the management tools were easily accessible. And I hope that this afternoon, as we all get involved in, in this process, that we are able to have a very productive interaction and a very meaningful session this evening. So welcome, everyone. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Aline. Um, as Dr. Aline mentioned, this plan is not the Coastal Zone Management Unit's plan, but a plan for everyone in Barbados all of our constituents, all of our stakeholders, all of our beach users, everyone. We would like your comments on this plan. So if you can, at this point in time, you can start sending your comments to us. You can send your comments using the uh, question and answer tab at the bottom of your screens. You can start sending them so we can have a good idea of what you're thinking about our plan. At this point in time, I'll turn over to the director of the Coastal Zone Management Unit, who will give us a general idea of what this plan is about and tell us about what this sub era, why is this our sub era three? What is so different about it? Dr. Brewster. Thanks a lot, Alison. Uh, as we've been telling this story, it's always good to get the, the history as to how we got here. So just for a quick recap, <clears throat> the first plan that was done for Barbados in terms of the integrated coastal zone management plan was done in 1995 after the South and West Coast studies had been concluded as part of the pre-feasibility and pre-investment studies that had been done between 83 and 95. During that study, we documented a lot of information and we were at the fledging stages then in terms of trying to look at how we can integrate climate change considerations into coastal engineering designs uh, as a way forward. The second plan was developed in 1998 after we had finished the East Coast study, in essence, from Maycox Bay around the East Coast to South Point. And that presented a comprehensive compilation of all the information for the East Coast study. It also looked at um, assessing beach changes on the East Coast uh, in comparison to those on the West Coast. And by actually then trying to standardize the report formatting and presentation, we then came up with the identification of priority areas for integrated coastal zone management for Barbados. And we divided the coastline into eight sub areas, um, each of which is unique in its own right, not being repeated anywhere else around the island. And it is this uh, sub area process that we are now going through has, has been pointed out by both Alison and uh, Dr. Ali. This plan now in 2021, in essence, is the combined coastal study which incorporates climate change and disaster risk reduction into the integrated coastal zone management process. Some people ask why it's necessary to have the update. And the reality is, is that modern coastal management delivery as a model has to now start to encompass the considerations of climate change and disaster risk reduction, because we've seen that over the years, um, everything is getting a little more intense in terms of climate activity. The new delivery model seeks to, seeks to introduce improved coastal risk understanding and the procedures for infrastructure and non-structural design and adaptation measures that can be used to build a, a resilient coastline and a climate-induced coastal hazards uh, resistant coastline which embraces the principles of integrated coastal management. But as been pointed out by Dr. Aline, implementation of ICZM is not easy. And more importantly now, looking at how we're gonna integrate risk resiliency into ICZM clearly demonstrates it's not a simple task. The key differences between the 1998 plan and the, 20, and the 2000, 2020 plan 
are such that the first plan 1998 was comprised of three volumes, the policy framework document, the West Coast and the East Coast uh, plans, while the 2020 document is only two documents comprised of the policy framework document and the integrated plan with climate change adaptation. In 1998, the development guidance for management of coastal uses, coastal development regulations along the coastline, uh, which have been applied up till now in terms of ongoing coastal development application assessments were used. And the policy framework itself focused considerably on a lot of activities that were current at the time. This plan focuses on how we're going to improve the capacity of the coastal zone management unit to integrate climate change considerations into the coastal management process. We're looking at how we can build the relationships between our agencies and others within the, the construct as to how the plan is rolled out into the future. The plan spans a, a, a 10 year time frame, And the intended impact of the plan is to provide detailed guidance on the management of coastal resources, development and regulation along the coastline. It still focuses on the island, manage, island systems management approach that we've always used because anything that happens in the, in the center of the island can impact on a coastline in, in two hours or under in some instances, especially as it relates to rainfall. But more importantly, when water is moving underground, it can take a, a far longer period, but can still have some impact. And it, it focuses also on the relationship between the protection of coastal resources and the reduction in climate change and disaster risk reduction to increase our role as the unit in terms of our appreciation as to how we look at the implementation of development application considerations. Additionally, we've now been able to finalize the coastal management area boundary and a zone of influence that can impact on that boundary. And in essence, it isn't just only a seaward boundary that we will be looking at, but we also have a landward boundary now that is a lot more defined in terms of how we can identify the spaces. If you look at the cost of doing nothing, if we were not to implement this plan, you would see that the activities that speak to how inundation uh, areas from storm surge and coastal flooding are mapped would be left out. It would also deal with issues that speak to the type of mitigation measures that need to be applied that weren't considered in the past in terms of potential building design along the coastline. And while costings for mitigation measures are still to be determined because, you know, this is a rollout phase, so it takes a long time to get a good appreciation. As it stands right now, we have some preliminary estimates as to what will be required as we're rolling into the next phase of the coastal conservation program for the island. And we have to focus now on how we spend money in considering uh, damage repair after disasters occur or we get impacted. The key policy outcomes for the plan in 2020 are six, focusing primarily on sustainable socioeconomic development. Coastal resources are protected and effectively managed. The climate and disaster risk adaptive capacity within the coastal zone management unit is strengthened. Integrated coastal zone management is delivered through a coordinated governance mechanism and arrangement, which is something that has to be a lot more uh, closely interlocked now with other agencies. And the capacity for the ICZM delivery is strengthened through all the relevant sectors, more public education and outreach, and that research and understanding and knowledge outreach is increased so that we can send our message out to the public in general. The structure of the plan is uh, a four part document. The first part sets the scene for how we develop a coastal resilient ICZM. The second part deals with the creating of an adaptive pathway to identify pathway priorities for consideration and the identification and assessment of key areas of concern. The third part looks at the national guidance in terms of disaster risk management, climate change adaptation, beach management, compliance and enforcement, uh, construction and maintenance of coastal structures, new emerging issues that are impacting on the coastline, uh, biodiversity conservation and coastal habitat restoration, non-living resources, exploitation and exploration, 
general research and public awareness and stakeholder participation. And then the meat of the matter is captured in, in part four, which speaks to the sub-area action briefs, where we get main themes around what each sub-area entails, a general description, some of the issues that are encountered, development planning, setback requirements, and the action briefs in terms of what COSO has to do to roll out this plan for within each sub-area. In summary, then, we can say that the plan looks like it's going to be a very dynamic and informative plan. We have activities that are divided into the short, short term, medium and long term. And we're also looking to see how this new integrated approach to coastal management can focus on the core functions of the office more actively, better define island systems management, and that we can use it to generate lasting knowledge on the island itself especially as coastline and as part of the new blue economy strategy, roll out to see how it will be implemented as part of any other national plans within the blue economy space. Thanks a lot, Alison. You're welcome, Dr. Brewster. I haven't seen any questions uh, at this point in time. So start sending those questions. I know that you have some burning issues that you want to bring up. At this point in time, let me introduce the team leader for the entire consultancy. This is Mr. Jonathan McHugh. Mr. McHugh will deal with a poll at first, and then he will go on to present the general themes and ideas uh, regarding this sub area. Jonathan. Thank you, Alison, and good evening, everybody. Um, we're gonna start by uh, sending, testing technology out and uh, opening the floor to all attendees to give us some information on their understanding based on what they've heard from Dr. Brewster, uh, their history in ICZM in Barbados, and also their uses of your wonderful coast. So on the screen, you'll see four, four quick questions coming up. And the first one is helping us to understand your appreciation of ICZM planning in Barbados. So this question is, are you aware of the current ICZM plan in Barbados that was written by Hal Crow in 1998. A nice simple first question to uh, get the ball rolling. We're just looking to see whether you are aware of, uh, are aware of it, you're not aware of it, or you're, you're a little bit uncertain. So give us your, your vote on that. And on the screen, in about five or five to 10 seconds, we'll be able to get an idea based on the attendees tonight who is aware of the, the existing plan. So from our audience tonight, we've got a good 70% of people are aware um, and close to 30% close to that, are, that are not aware. We have a second question, which um, builds on Dr. Brewster's comment, which is outlining what the purpose of tonight is about and the purpose of this public inquiry. And the question very simply is, have you reviewed the draft updated 2020 ICZM plan, which is uploaded on the Coastal Zone Management Unit's website. So, and the simple answers are, uh, I didn't know about the plan. Secondly, I know of it, but I haven't had time to review it. Or thirdly, you've, been, you've all done your homework and you've reviewed it in some detail. This will give us an idea as to uh, kind of the knowledge that people have of the, the new revisions to this plan. And it's this plan which I'll be giving four quick presentations on after these quick polls. So the results coming through, 67% of us are aware of, the, aware of this, um, but I haven't had time to review it. 27% um, of you have been extremely good and uh, have had a look at this in a bit more detail. So that gives us a good flavour as to uh, kind of the, the expectations of, of this presentation. Two more questions to come. This one is about you and what your key coastal interests are, whether this is in sub area three or, or on a national basis. So your key interests, let us know if you use the coast for personal recreation, whether you actually live actually on the coast or whether your business is reliant on the um, protection of the coastal resources that the plan is protecting. 
So give us your perspective on uh, your personal situation with regard to the Barbados coast. And the results will give us a flavour as to the usability of the current audience. So we have a sort of half and a, and a quarter split, 50% of people demonstrating that they um, make use of the coast for recreation purposes. And the remaining 25% either live on the coast or their business is reliant on, on the resources. And we have one final question. And that basically is what type of a stakeholder are you? Are you a member of the general public that are just very interested or you have specific concerns that you'd like to raise this evening? Are you employed within the private sector? Do you work for a public institution? Or are you working for civil society in a, a non-government organization? And this is quite an, uh, an interesting question just to get a, give us an, an interpretation of the, uh, the level of uh, stakeholder that's listening in. And tonight's audience essentially is a mix of the four, um, which actually is quite a, a, a good a good sort of analogy to, to, to have. So what we'll be doing now is I'm going to um, have a, um, a series of presentations which um, add a little bit more detail onto Dr. Brewster's um, onto Dr. Brewster's comments. And the first is a very quick um, presentation that's designed um, to ensure that we're all on the same page with regards to the global and regional significance of climate change and how this may manifest itself in terms of more localized disaster events that may present themselves in this or other sub areas of Barbados. Our dialogue these days has regrettably been overtaken by COVID-19. However, this pandemic is not the only global threat that we face that is running in parallel. And that is that climate change and the crisis that it's bringing continues. So with reference to the climate story, you as Caribbean people are therefore at the forefront of this planetary threat. And your communities, your businesses remain acutely vulnerable to the dangers of rising seas and other impacts that are accelerating with climate change. And this is constituting a real risk should global average temperatures exceed 1.5 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels. So at a regional scale, you live in one of the most active tropical cyclone regions of the world. And you're also facing increased health challenges as a consequence of a changing climate. Powerful tropical storms and hurricanes, damaged reefs and fisheries, worsening droughts and sea level rise are all threatening the natural defences of Barbados. And this is forcing it to navigate a new reality. And I shall come on to this issue in a, in a little bit more detail quite soon. But latest projected warming trends of between one degree Celsius and five degrees Celsius are being predicted by the Caribbean Institute of Meteorology and, and Hydrology. And this has been confirmed by the increasing frequency of heat waves that are being recorded within the region and you may have experienced during 2020. In fact, the latest predictions from NOAA are suggesting that the 2021 hurricane season is to be above normal with six to 10 hurricanes and three to five major hurricanes predicted. In addition, and linked to these climate factors, scientists are prompted to state that dengue fever and other mosquito-borne illnesses may increase as climate change worsens. And it's known that Barbados has been experiencing these health risks at, at first hand. So for Barbados, as well as other Caribbean nations, a, a common challenge that's being faced relates to the need to safeguard not only their people, but also their nat national critical infrastructure. And to this end, that the economic functioning of the region is at risk. For example, there are 129 airports and airstrips that service commercial airlines, transporting you and your families efficiently and effectively around the region. There are 172 seaports, each, cont each containing ports, jetties, and wharfs 
that help to distribute the commodities and goods that are held within container terminals. And there are also 131 energy facilities in place in the region, such as power plants and oil refineries. And with spe specific reference to Barbados, much of its critical infrastructure is located within the coastal zone, though their spatial footprint remains relatively small. Grantly Adams International Airport, the land cover associated with that, for example, extends to nearly 1.2 square kilometers, whereas the Port of Barbados is approximately 0.7 square kilometers with other energy facilities covering far less space. There is incessant pressure on a global scale to continue with a business as usual state of, state of affairs, meaning that all built assets, whether they're critical or not, should be defended from, for example, flood risk. However, everything cannot be protected via the adoption of hard engineering solutions. The cost of this globally would be astronomical. In fact, adaptation costs in developing countries, currently estimated at 70 billion US dollars per year, is expected to reach up to 300 billion US dollars per year by the end of the decade in 2030. So the Coastal Zone Management Unit, as you've heard from Dr. Brewster, over the past 20 years have been studying the, the effects of climate change on the coast of Barbados. And their work as part of the Coastal Risk Management Programme, in summary, has concluded that a series of key climate-related hazards must be managed in an integrated manner if any ICZM strategy or plan is to be effective and successful. And in addition to hazards such as oil spills and terrestrial flooding, these must include hazards such as hurricanes or tropical storms, separate storm surge events, landslides, which are highly relevant to, to this evening's discussion in sub area three, coastal erosion and sea level rise. And in addition, tsunami wave inundation should, should also be embraced as a possible high impact, but low frequency hazard, hazard event along the coast. So the climate story therefore needs to be understood in totality. And it's this which the revised ICZM plan is at the center of. As you can see from this slide, society depends on the effective functioning of a range of sectors. And these can be seen as different colors, notably yellow for financial, brown for infrastructure, blue for social services and green for natural resources. And these sectors are all faced by a range of risks including those that are relating to tourism, which could be asset or finance related, national development, such as manufacturing, health, education or social service related, or cross-cutting risks. And you'll see that coastal and ocean resources fall under this latter category, and hence the whole ICZM planning process, which is being communicated to you this evening, is critical in playing a major role in delivering a sustainable national planning outcome for Barbados. This slide aligns the same identified sectors against the key climate hazards that, are, that I had identified to you earlier, namely increased temperature, changing rainfall patterns, but perhaps most key to this evening's talk relates to extreme events such as hurricanes and storms and sea level rise. And these are the core hazards that require immediate high priority attention, you'll see that are highlighted in red within that black, um, that black shape. So the revised ICZM plan therefore recognizes the importance of taking a holistic approach to adaptation and resiliency in order to respond to the impacts of climate change. In fact, Barbados is already pioneering this concept through its new Roofs to Reef program, which embraces a range of natural, terrestrial and coastal resource types, thus representing a, a truly transformative approach to lasting climate resilience. So what do we mean by coastal resources? Well, these can include cultural resources that are specific to the Barbados coast. It can include valued seascapes, such as on such as the, the stretch from Barclays Park to Bathsheba that we can be talking about this evening. Though more commonly, they're understood as being coastal habitats or ecosystems, such as beaches, coral reefs, wetlands, or coastal, coastal cliffs. And protecting coastal resources, therefore, is of critical importance to this plan and 
to be a national priority within the physical development plan. So I'm going to introduce another poll question now, which is devoted to capturing the key message of this quick presentation. And the outcome result will help us to confirm the methodology which we've adopted for the creation of a newly defined coastal management, coastal zone management area. So the question is as follows. We're looking for you to rank what you believe are the most important um, coastal resources in Barbados. And as you scroll down, you will see that number one is dealing with beaches and dunes. And we want you to uh, give them a score, give beaches and dunes a score. If you believe they're of low importance to Barbados, you score it one. If you think they're very important, you score it number five. And the same will apply to another, the remaining five coastal resources. So you'll see the same question for coastal cliffs and caves. As you move down for wetlands, swamps and ponds. We then move to coral reefs and seabeds. Then to cultural resources. And finally, to geological formations, landscapes and seascapes. And the reason we're doing this is to allow you as key stakeholders to give yourself some thought as to um, what is of pivotal importance in terms of protection for the future. So it'll be quite good to sort of get your scores. We'll then put on the screen the scores and that will lead in to my second presentation on the details of the coastal zone management area. So we'll give you um, a few moments to do that. And as if by magic, the scores quickly come up. So I'll quickly give you what we have so far. I'm very pleased to see that at least not, well, we've got 92% of you are saying that beaches and dunes are of pivotal importance. We then move down and for coastal cliffs and caves, we've got a bit more of a mix but predominantly we have 38, two lots of 38%. So that's 70, 76% of you are saying that coastal cliffs are very important or, or important. Wetlands, again, uh, ranging from sort of averagely important to very important. Coral reefs, as predicted, would um, command an 85% score. Cultural resources, Interestingly, get a little bit more of a mix, ranging, including a few ones of low importance. And then we move to the final one of, of geological formations and landscapes and seascapes. And with particular reference to this evening, it's of, of importance to sort of see what score we get there. And we're getting high scores for the importance of protecting geological formations and seascapes. So that, um, the, the poll results there um, are, are leading in quite nicely into this next 10 minute presentation, because this will build upon the previous one coupled, coupled with the results from that poll question to demonstrate the approach that the consultant team and Coastal Zone Management Unit adopted towards revising the boundaries of the Coastal Zone Management Area. And it also provides an overview as to how um, new and innovative setback classifications are being proposed. And technical details of these issues are all found within volume two of the ICZM plan, particularly parts A2 for the coastal zone management area and part C3 for setbacks. So the first question that he's posing is, why do we need a coastal zone management area? And the simple answer, is that there is a formal mandate on the Coastal Zone Management Unit to protect coastal resources as defined within the CZM Act of 1998. And it also helps to define the boundary or the geographic scope of this revised ICZM plan. The intention is that the policies, regulations or advisories of relevance within the defined Coastal Zone Management Area must pay due cognizance to the ICZM plan and associated policies so that development is planned or implemented to be climate resilient in nature 
And as a result of that, that should hope to reduce coastal risks and ensure the promotion of healthy coastal ecosystems, as I've presented earlier. And the coastal zone management area essentially is the area where all relevant coastal resource resources apply, in addition to those socioeconomic activities that may have an impact on coastal resource health, status or integrity. As well as the current Coastal Zone Management Act of 1998, the more recent Planning and Development Act of 2019 states that any new development proposal that's identified within this coastal zone management area shall have regard to the provisions and guidelines as set out in the ICZM plan. And that's an important point which we'll come on to later and probably during the questions and answer session. This means that the Coastal Zone Management Unit will be acting in an advisory capacity to all statutory authorities on all relevant policies, regulations and advisories that apply within this area. But it should be understood that you can see on the slide that the Coastal Zone Management Area was not the same as a development setback distance. And this distance should be explained a little later in this presentation. So that recent poll that you, uh, you just did for us on coastal resources um, demonstrated that a range of coastal resources are needed to um, be considered to help determine the limits, the inland and the offshore limits of this coastal zone management area. And put simply, highly technical surveys and analyses that have been carried out by the unit over the past decade or so have been used to help define the inland and the offshore limits of the coastal zone management area. And this is considered not only the geographic footprint of coastal habitats, such as resources, such as beaches or the surf zone or the extent of sand dunes, but it also um, provides the extent of natural habitats, including wetlands, uh, the ecosystem associated with that, and the, the relationship between um, migratory species and the importance of habitats such as sea, seagrass beds. This slide um, presents some of the recent work that was undertaken by the Coastal Zone Management Unit to determine within sub area three, which we're talking about tonight, the indicative inland extent of flood inundation under a mid range regional storm surge and tsunami scenario up to the year 2060. And you can see that in the blue, uh, the blue areas that are on the screen. And it also shows in addition um, a more extreme scenario for the same hazard types, which you can see in red, up to the year 2100, which represents a more of a worst case scenario. A lot of this detail is, uh, is then interpreted, digested and, and turned into meaningful policies, which we'll come on to um, a little bit later. In tandem with the latest predictions of coastal hazard, um, inland uh, limit impacts, a set of detailed criteria has also been used to help determine the inland and offshore limits of each of the separate coastal resources. For example, you'll see that for coral reefs, the criteria used is related to the extent of living shallow water coral reef ecosystems, which is estimated at being close to the 150 meter bathymetric contour. Whereas the other pink uh, box, um, defines coastal landscape protection areas and national park landscapes, which are as denoted within the physical development plan of 2017. And this is separate because this commands a, a 200 meter inland buffer from the coastline. So the outcome of this analysis work is that the coastal zone management area, area is, a var is variable in its extent around the country. And exact um, coordinates of this are presented within the revised ICZM plan and details are included as a specific order entitled the Coastal Zone Management Area Boundaries Order of 2021, which includes specific longitude latitude coordinates, each being about 50 metres apart. And this is new to the work that was done in 1998. And you'll see from the slide in green, specifically for sub area three, um, that this area has updated inland and offshore limits that were originally established within that first 1998 plan, 
And you can see that from the blue diagonal lines on the slide. But put simply, the landward limit includes key terrestrial coastal habitats and those areas exposed to coastal hazards, as I've already mentioned. This landward area has also includes the minimum 30 metre setback from the high water mark established within the physical development plan. And it's noted by the red arrows that you can see uh, that this differs from the approach adopted in 1998 by Halcrow in that inland limits were commonly defined by the coastal roads that operate along many of the sub areas. The seaward limit remains similar to the extent as defined in 1998 containing key marine resources or habitats, plus protected or restricted marine areas, areas of outstanding seascape value, and the surf zone where active sediment transportation takes place that influences beach profile shape. As Dr Brewster mentioned earlier, a separate zone of influence is new, and this is defined which extends from the seaward limit of the coastal zone management area out to the 12 mile territorial limits. And here, the role of the Coastal Zone Management Unit will be to raise awareness on marine developments to both the public and private sectors, civil society and the general public, or where future consideration of an offshore activity is being raised as part of a separate yet parallel blue economy strategy, which is currently taking place in the country. This may help to provide advice on the development of joint initiatives to promote the conservation and sustainable exploitation of coastal resources within this zone of influence. So before I move on to discuss the new approach with regard to development setbacks, uh, we have another poll question for you. And the question is, 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 a, is as follows. We'll be interested to get your view. Do you agree with this new revised delimitation of the coastal management area compared to that that was defined in 1998? And you have five options here. The first one is, yes, I understand the reasoning for the change in totality. Secondly is, yes, I agree, but in part it does appear too wide, either inland and offshore. The third option is, yes, but in part it appears too narrow, both inland and offshore. Fourthly, no, I would recommend we remain with the 1998 version. Or fifthly, you don't really have a view in any, any specific way. So your, your answer to that would be quite useful for this um, public inquiry. So I'll give you a few moments to give us your views on that. And we'll see what the results tell us. And I'm pleased to see that we have a 64% um response positive response that the methodology has has credence and value uh, we have a few a few about 18 percent of people saying that there's probably no value in this sub area to um to change so uh that's an interesting observation so what we'll do now is i'm going to move on to the next um quick section and we're not going to briefly outline how the revised ICZM plan is to use the coastal zone management area to improve climate resiliency into development, developmental planning through the use of planning setbacks. So there's a question, you know, why, why is this needed? Why are setbacks needed? Well, setting restrictions to improve climate compatible physical development within the coastal zone management area is an essential tool to help to better safeguard coastal resources and to minimise inappropriate development within high or very high coastal risk areas. Setbacks, in fact, are a key tool. They're often used by coastal planners on a global, uh, and, and on a global scale. And they refer to areas where development should be restricted or where specific provisions need to be imposed or applied to ensure the safety of structures, persons and the wider communities, especially in the context of climate change. And in Barbados, setback policies are not new, though historically linear distances selected were often not technically justified due to a poor understanding of climate related impacts. Consequently, 
The currently defined 30 metre distance from mean high water as defined within the physical development plan and also as stated within the new Planning and Development Act of 2019 has been deemed in some instances as somewhat arbitrary. This is why the revised ICZM plan and associated maps, which I'll be discussing in a few moments, represent a new way forward to better guide development planning within the coastal zone management area. What the revised ICZM plan is now able to offer is a suite of revised setback distances and categories that are not only dictated by improved scientific understanding, but it's, they're, they're designed to encourage development to take place, even within defined limits, so long as it complies with necessary environmental impact assessment regulations and technical studies that are deemed necessary by either town and country planning or as advised by supporting agencies such as Coastal Zone Management Unit or the Ministry of Public Works. So regarding setback, a series of different policy types are proposed depending upon spatial topography, conservation, landscape value, and the level of coastal risk that is known for a location. But specific points to note with regard to these setbacks are as follows. Firstly, they only apply to new constructions or developments that are planned after the approval of this ICZM plan. Secondly, they cannot be retroactively enforced for existing developments. Thirdly, they only apply to major developments defined by the PDP of 2017. And fourthly, it's important to realize that even as even in the case of major developments, their construction can still take place within the defined setback limits, so long as a developer carries out satisfactory studies and delivers and has accepted the sufficient evidence through an environmental impact assessment to demonstrate any mitigation issues. And such, such studies need to demonstrate that this new knowledge of flooding or erosion hazards produced by the Coastal Zone Management Unit via the um, National Coastal Risk Information um, Platform system is embraced. And from this information that robust, effective risk reduction measures are included into any design. So what do these setbacks look like in reality in sub area three? Well, you can see that they include the following possibilities. Firstly, in orange, thin strip of orange, you'll see the minimum 30 meter setback as defined in the PDP. And this remains for everywhere in all sub areas around the, the coastal zone management area. And this minimum distance can then be enhanced subject to the hazards or the resource protection needs. Uh, and this extra distance will be determined by separate technical analysis, which has been, which has taken place. And you can see on the screen that this can include the following. There are some short areas of blue, and these are entitled cliff collapse setback areas. And this is a variable distance that's classified into seven setback categories, according to cliff type as set by Golder Associates in a very detailed geotechnical analysis undertaken in 2017. And as you can see from the gray box to the right hand side of the screen, um, that this can range from an additional 18 meters through to 65 meters. And then thirdly in yellow, you'll see a broad band on the screen and this is a landscape setback distance. And this, again, this is variable, highly relevant to this evening's discussion for sub area three. And it can extend from between 100 meters in rural areas to 200 meters in landscape protection areas or within the national park, as you can see on the screen here. This slide shows the detailed geotechnical analysis mapping work that was completed in 2017 from concept point to concept bay for sub area three. And very briefly, it just demonstrates and adds to what you, I've already showed you that it identifies geotechnical risk class categories in different colors. And these colors each denote a level of cliff failure probability. 
Um, and there's a, the key at the bottom of the slide shows a usage guidelines for future development within defined total setback areas. So the message here is that the ICZM plan has embraced uh, some very detailed technical analysis and tried to transpose that into easy to understand setback guides for developers, um, which in the past was not uh, available. For low-lying coastal areas, again in sub-area three, such as in Martins Bay, setbacks are proposed to include the following possibilities. As above, the, the minimum 30 meter setback in red, in the red hashed line, is defined in the PDP, and that remains everywhere within the coastal zone management area. And this minimum distance is then enhanced upon, subject to the hazards and the protection needs based on topography and flood inundation. So there are two additional setbacks proposed, and you'll see this on the screen. The first is a flood inundation setback, which is defined as the uh, that blue, uh, light blue area, which again is a variable, and it includes storm surge flood inundation to a one in 100 year return flood return event, plus any additional tsunami flood event that has been modeled for the area. And here a policy of no new developments are recommended within that, within that particular setback. In addition, you'll see a climate change adaptation setback, and that's in a slightly paler blue, just to the bottom, to the um, southern part of, the, of the, um, the slide. Again, this is variable, and this is estimated using the latest IPCC sea level rise projections. And this additional setback distance is added on to the flood inundation setback to ensure that all issues related to sea level rise predictions are embraced into developmental planning. As Dr. Brewster said in his presentation, um, the plan not only is providing uh, a, a summary of very detailed technical analysis, it also has some key parts to it which provide general guidance for developers, for users of the coast, for the general public, and for businesses alike. And this is presented in, in part C. Part E talks about the implementation of the plan, and I'll, I'll touch on both of these uh, very quickly. Part C represents the general policy guidance for the ICZM plan area. And this part provides guidance for risk resilient ICZM delivery from a national perspective, to address the policy outcomes that are defined in volume one of the ICZM plan. And you can see in front of you that there are 10 topics covered that deal with the national management priorities that are relevant to the whole of the coastal zone management area of Barbados. And each topic provides a description of the current status of that topic, followed by the possible national implications of not considering that specific topic and the impact that this may have on delivering sustainable integrated coastal zone management. From that, the management guidance is then presented on how the topic should be applied in a manner that best embraces climate and disaster resilience. And finally, actions are listed with recommendations on suitable lead, lead organizations to take forward each proposed action, a timescale for its implementation is given be it short term, medium term, or longer term, five to 10 years, and an indicator, which can be used to measure progress during the lifespan of this ICZM plan up to 2030. And as you've heard, and as you're gonna to continue to hear, the main difference of this plan is that we are focusing on risk, disaster risk and climate change adaptation. And all the, the guidance provided in this part C is developed to ensure consideration is given to key risk management pillars. And these pillars are shown in the slide and in the different colors. You can see risk reduction, response readiness, response execution, which is basically you know, activities during an actual hazard or a, sorry, during a disaster event. And finally, the recovery phase, which includes issues such as um, financing 
risk. And these four R's, if you want to call them, illustrate the measures which public and private institutions, corporate, civil society, and communities in Barbados need to adopt in order to reduce the impact of disasters or climate change within the defined coastal zone management area. They also illustrate how the government of Barbados needs to react during and immediately after a disaster, followed by the steps to best recover from such natural events after it's occurred. So part C is important because it identifies which of these four R's are most applicable to the national guidance topic being provided. For example, you'll see now on the screen for the topic of beach management, that the relevant disaster pillars of most, re uh, of most relevance are risk reduction, response readiness, and response execution. So that just gives a graphical interpretation of, of that link. What part C also shows um, using the example of the general guidance for public awareness and stakeholder participation, is you'll see in this table that preparedness and response are the key disaster risk management cycle phases of relevance here. And you can see that from the yellow and the green squares. In fact, these tables are produced for each of the 10 general guidance themes, and each of them shows relevant legislation to that theme, relevant ICZ and policy outcomes, policy goals. And it also produces a suite of action briefs that are then produced for each theme. And these contain a range of actions that aren't necessarily sub area specific, but they're certainly of relevance to each sub area. And lead and support actors are defined, how the action relates to each, uh, leads to others, along with the scales the time scales for delivery. And finally, all actions, um, sorry, at this action table level, all of them, all the indicators defined are produced to help to periodically monitor the implementation of the proposed guidance action, which generally is defined by means of an annual monitoring or a, a summary report or something similar to that. Part E, focuses on ICZM plan implementation. And this will be a long-term and continuous process that involves a range of agencies, institutions, and authorities. This is often known as the whole of government approach. And this is at the heart of this ICZM plan, as Alison said earlier. Some elements require immediate action and will be straightforward to incorporate into day-to-day -day operations of responsible agencies. But in certain situations, uh, elements can be built onto existing arrangements or require private individuals and the general public to support implementation. Hence, not just whole of government, but almost whole of society. There may also be the need for new procedures and practices to be developed over time because the considerable scope and variety of topics covered by this new plan, which does include new emerging issues that may arise, all need to be addressed. And importantly, the cross-sectoral nature of many objectives to be achieved in the plan will require maximum coordination and collaboration amongst all government levels and agencies, developers and Barbadian communities alike. So as shown in this diagram on the screen, all six ICZM policy outcomes are proposed to be achieved through compliance to four priority areas and these are set out as the pillars in the diagram, namely collaboration, capacity to continue, commitment, and communication. And of course, more detail on this is readily available within party of the report. The party is important for you to understand that it does identify a clear roadmap as shown in this slide, um, which is also designed to link the various national guidance actions as I've talked about in part C, to the six ICs and policy outcomes. And each specific action per national guidance is then assigned to one or a range of ICs and policy outcomes as appropriate. And these are assigned a roadmap, a, a timeline, as shown in the different coloured stars. Namely, roadmap one might be a short term, which might be for two years, 
um, roadmap two for medium term, more like um, five years of delivery, or a roadmap three, the longer term, to be achieved at the end of this plan period up to 2030. In addition, you can see that Part E also goes into good detail into a range of important supporting implementation topics. We don't have time to go into these um, during this presentation, but this does include topics such as information needs and data management, education, training and public outreach, institutional and capacity related needs, evaluation and monitoring procedures, and importantly, how much is this going to cost and where's the money coming from? with regard to financial considerations. And on this latter point, as Dr. Brewster said, during this public inquiry period, no formal figure has currently been set up with regard to the budgets required to formally implement the plan. However, following this public, in, in, public inquiry, efforts will be undertaken to fine tune uh, a rate, the range of actions proposed so that a more targeted value can be placed on plan delivery over the coming 10 years. So my final quick presentation is just to give you a, an idea of um, the summary of the early presentations that I've given, but focus briefly on the key specific features of sub area three, couple, coupled with a brief description of the various maps that have been produced. So with, with regard to sub area three, which extends from concept point to the choice, this covers a short section of the east coast of Barbados. The main landscape features um, include the Barbados National Park as classified within the PDP. There's a, a strong topographical variety within this sub area when compared to other sub areas. And so this is, this is what makes it stand out quite well. It consists of sloping areas between the main escarpment and the coast. And it's, in places quite heavily eroded. With a low population density, the economic activities are quite diverse. Res residential, tourist, agriculture and fisheries and sand extraction all take place. And the sub area commands quite high potential for ecotourism development and associated recreational activities. Regarding coastal risks, however, storm surge inundation may become a future issue due to the shallow topographic slope gradients that you do witness, for example, from Bathsheba up to Cattle Wash. And at this time, it's perhaps relevant to remind you that all of the six ICZM policy outcomes that have been set for the coastal zone management area, as referred to by Dr. Brewster earlier, those are of most relevance to sub area two, so sub area three, include Outcome one, which is sustainable socioeconomic development is achieved, and outcome two, which is coastal resources are protected and effectively managed. This slide is taken from part D of the ICZM plan. And based on the risks and features known in sub area three, it shows that a series of possible actions could be considered. And you'll see on the left hand side that each possible action is assigned um, for sub area three is aligned to the revised general guidance topics which have already been discussed to you and can be found these can all be found in in part c and d of the iczm plan for example you can see that each action is given a unique code and highlighted in pink you can see a couple of examples just quickly for discussion firstly under the general guidance topic of beach management for sub area three an action is defined to elaborate a plan to promote environmentally friendly tourism and recreational activities and upgrading existing walks and facilities. In addition, there's also an action to develop and implement a beach management plan for the national park. And likewise, um, to support the coastal biodiversity theme, you'll see at the bottom there, an action is set to promote improved fishery schemes for Concert and Tent Bay. And this would include strategies for improved fish landing facilities, amongst other as aspects. And this is an important local issue, which perhaps we can have uh, some questions on later, because Tent and Concert Bays 
the communities there are do contain local fisher folk hence it's an important base for local fishermen who operate trap fisheries plus fisheries out to the nearby reefs targeting uh, more deeper slope pelagic fish stocks in addition to support the theme of non-living resource exploitation and in line with ICZM policy outcome four, a set of actions are also proposed. And these are set to formalize regulations and to promote restoration of the dunes as compensatory measures to any developers who perform extraction activities in Belle Plain and Walker's Savannah. Of course, much more detail is provided in the draft plan um, and if you have not had time to review those actions in detail, I'd urge you to review part C and D of the plan, um, which is available on the on the Season Amuse website. This slide um, shows the legend or the key that's been produced for all description related maps in part D of the plan. And you can see for um, you can see that these maps show environmental features, natural or restricted areas. Coastal classifications, such as whether the coast is eroding, accreting or stable, and any associated flood related hazards falling within the defined coastal zone management area. With, with regard to the latter point, this helps to deliver ICZM policy three, namely climate and disaster risk adaptive capacity is strengthened. And this should be best implemented through compliance um, through the following suite of maps that are contained within, within the plan. We can see to the southeastern tip of sub area three that from Concept Bay through to Bath Beach, that the, the natural coast is quite low lying and that storm surge inundation risks do apply. But for the remainder of the stretch from Bath Beach to beyond the Conga Rocks and into Martins Bay, or just before Martins Bay, that the coastal cliffs reappear which is in part experiencing medium levels of cliff failure and slippage. And as a consequence of these features, and with regard to setback policies, we can see that in this part of sub area three, that there are recommendations for landscape setback up to the limit of the coastal zone management area. Specific cliff collapse setback distances are also defined, which shall be subject to the different cliff classifications given to this area as defined a bit earlier in my presentation, particularly to the east of Bath Beach and at Conga Rocks. And again, just to reaffirm, these setback guidance policies are defined for, um, for the different setback categories. They apply only to planned constructions or developments, and it cannot be retroactively be enforced for existing developments. On the screen for this stretch, for uh, the low-lying Martins Bay, that transitions to medium failure cliffs eastward to Tent Bay. The coastal plain that extends as being low lying from Tent Bay through to and beyond the Roundhouse restaurant northeast of Bathsheba. And as a consequence of these features and with regard to setback policies, we can see in this part of the sub area three that there are recommendations for landscape setback up to the limits of the coastal zone management area and cliff collapse setback policies of varying, varying distances depending on cliff type and more low-lying topographic areas where short, where some short flood inundation setback policies for specific areas can be seen. And you can see those at Martins Bay to the um, southeast and from Hillcrest through to Bathsheba further to the northeast. On this slide, you'll see uh, we, uh, for, to save time, I've got two images together. And this dynamically stable coast is shown in these two maps extending southeast to northwest from Cattle Wash through to Barclays Park, Walker's Savannah, through to the Choice south of Morgan Lewis Beach. And a range of turtle nesting sites are present along this important length of coast. And as a consequence of these features and with regard to setback policies, we can see in this part of sub area three that there are recommendations again for the protection of the landscape value and also for extensive areas of flood inundation setback policies for specific areas, particularly within Walker's Savannah, 
and the savannah south of the choice. So this gives you a, a bit of a story as to um, subarea three, the technical work which has been carried out, the mapping of that work and the policy implications of the, um, the way forward. So before I sign off and pass back to Alison, I'm gonna just ask one more polling question. And that polling question is now on the screen. And based on what you've heard and based on your knowledge of subarea three, the question is, what measures do you feel are needed in the future for this subarea? And the options are number one, whether you feel that new engineering measures are needed to support the protection, rehabilitation, or management of coastal habitats. And you have a choice between one and, or a score between one and five. A second question is whether you feel that this, this sub area would really warrant new social measures as opposed to engineering measures, or in addition to engineering measures to see whether those social measures are needed to support vulnerable communities to address the, their resilience to coastal hazards. And then thirdly, whether you feel that new economic measures are needed in the sub area to support fisher for oak, to support uh, ecotourism, or to support marine area management or conservation in this particular sub area. So all three, it's not one or the other, you can give each of those engineering, social and economic measures a score. And it'll be good to get your perspective on that because this hopefully will be the launch pad for Alison to, look, to announce the, the question and answer session for the remainder of this, um, this evening's presentation. And the results are giving us a flavor of probably half of saying that engineering interventions are going to be required along this area. With regard to social measures, the highest score seems to be that 71% are saying that social measures are going to be important. And similarly, 64% are saying that economic measures are going to be needed. And that's an interesting finding because we're not just talking about coastal protection in this area. It is a fundamental area for resilience from a socioeconomic perspective. So I think the findings from that have been quite useful. So Alison, I'll pass over to yourself and we'll look forward to receiving questions from the attendees. Thank you. Thank you, Jonathan. Now is your chance, uh, participants, to ask your questions, make your comments. This is your plan as well as ours. So it's your time now to answer your questions. I have one question that came up earlier and it was, I'll read it out for you. It says in several places in the draft plan, reference is made to a new coastal zone management act that is, for, that is forthcoming. The assumption is that this plan will be administered under that legislation. It is difficult to analyze the plan's proposal without access to the draft legislation. Would the draft act be published for comment before the plan is approved? And I will answer that one for you, um, participants. Uh, the previous consultancy was for the preparation of the draft plan and the revision of the legislation. Obviously, when we got the legislation, we had to send it to the Chief Parliamentary Council to make sure that the legislation meets with this jurisdiction's requirement. And that is where the legislation is at at the moment. If it comes to the point that the legislation is not ready at the, um, as we go forward, we will have definitely to amend this plan to place it within the firm grasp of the existing legislation, CAP 394. So that is where we're at at the present moment. It was drafted, but it had to go to the CPC for them to review the, the legislation. 
I hope I've answered your question. If I have, just send me a comment and let me know if I've effectively answered your question on this one. Someone has also asked, will a copy of this presentation will be uh, available to the public? Uh, your presentation, John, uh, I think we can make it uh, available on our website. Um, yeah, going forward. I, yeah, I, I see no, no issue with that at all. Um, the practicalities, you're quite right. Um, we just need to agree whether it's gonna be on the website or elsewhere, but most probably uploaded on the website, I'd have thought. And that would be for, there's been slightly different presentations for different sub areas. So I'm guessing, Alison, what we'll do is we'll have um, an area on the website for the for the eight sub area presentations. I, I have a question for you, John. Um, you mentioned setbacks along this section of the coastline. What about policies to protect other environmental resources, such as our coral reefs, the inland ponds? What are the policies to protect the other resources, Jonathan? Okay, yeah, the um, site-specific policies for sub-area three are not defined, but part C of the general guidance does identify uh, clear actions for the uh, either advisory actions or links to existing pieces of legislation to protect flora, fauna, um, and um, migratory species, uh, non-living species. So with regard to, for example, coral reefs, um, there's no, dif no new defined policy for sub-area three, unless um, that, that has been sort of identified within uh, a specific developmental issue or whether there's been a specific survey that's identified a quite a unique subspecies of, of reef in a, a specific location. So the, the quick answer is that there's no there's no natural uh, unique policy for reefs or particular uh, habitats in sub area three unless it's been identified as uh, within part C of the general guidance. Okay, thank you very much. To provide the, 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 the overall overarching policy for the country. Okay, I have another question for you, Jonathan. What does the landscape setback mean and how is it applied? As defined in the plan, the landscape, the landscape policy is linked to uh, the, the recommendations and the, and the, the uh, inland limits stated within the physical development plan. So if it is within um, uh, an open space designation of the PDP or within the national park, as is our discussion tonight, that will be 200 metres inland from, from mean high water. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Jonathan. And I have a question for the panel and you can determine who will answer this. What are the hazards that were studied in order to come up with this plan? What were the hazards studied? I will pass this over to, I think I'll give it to Ricardo, the project manager. Hi, good night, everyone. Um, under component one of the coastal risk assessment and management program, we've done some diagnostic studies and assess a range of hazards, including storm surge, hurricane winds, tsunami, landslide, earthquake, um, cliff failure, um, yeah, I think, and, and beach erosion. Yeah, that's the full range of of hazards that were assessed. But the, the thing about it is that we are moving beyond simple hazard analysis and actually looking at risk in its true sense. So actually quantifying potential losses um, in different sectors of the shoreline and looking at cost effective ways to mitigate those losses. So going on the days of just doing hazard analysis, um, we're, we're playing that financial lens now and that will be key uh, in terms of efficiently uh, and effectively 
implemented measures to reduce export, well, to reduce the, the, the potential losses uh, during events um, and, and basically allow the country to recover from economic shocks, from hazards. All right, thank you very much, Ricardo. Another question which came up is that this site, this site has a large error, which is part of the abandoned train line. In terms of heritage protection, is there any policy in this plan to preserve the, um, the old train line? Any policies in this plan? Anyone can answer this for me. I can I can start, but I do need um, my friends in Barbados to give me the the geographic distance of the the old train line. I do know of it. There's, we don't have specific reference to it, but the reason why it's not necessarily mentioned specifically was that uh, the I think it is in in captured within the landscape um, protection zone uh, setback zone. Um, but as a cultural as a, a cultural feature, in terms of our methodology that people might have heard me uh, mentioning earlier, uh, that would have been incorporated to provide that inland distance for the coastal zone management area. But you're right, Alison, there is no specific policy for for that. But the policy it said is encouraging um, appropriate ecotourism related development, which could embrace the old railway line in future designs. But maybe somebody else in the panel could give me a, um, a little bit of extra local local knowledge on that. Um, if, if I can, I'd, good, even, good, even, good evening, everyone. Um, I think that you can't necessarily look at the plan, the draft and the coastal management plan entirely in isolation. You have to look at the plan in terms of its marriage with other policy documents such as the National Park Plan, okay? And this particular sub area falls clearly within the management mandate of the National Park Plan as a policy document, as well as the physical development plan. Um, so therefore the area is not only part of the National Park of Barbados, it is also part of the Natural Heritage Conservation Area as defined in the physical development plan. And that very question is something that we, from a planning perspective, have been making recommendations on uh, for applications um, that will fall within the vicinity of the old historic uh, train line. There are portions of that train line that actually exist within the near shore. And there are portions of that railway that are still terrestrial. There's, um, I think there's a pathway that passes just in front of, oh gosh, um, that hotel. Alison, help me. Um, um, that hotel. Atlantis? Going, Atlantis and, 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 and going along that area, or to um, Joe's River. Uh, you see, so... so it so, goes down so, to Belle Plain. Yeah, to, yeah, to Belle Plain. So for the areas of it that are still terrestrial, the actual tracks will not be there, but the coastal segments are... That, those, that pathway or that would have been previously occupied by a railway is actually no public lateral uses public lateral access in terms of hiking um, and, and those types of recreational activities you see uh, so it can it falls into 
to, 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 to more modern um, passive recreational use in some instances, okay? So in terms of preserving the accessories, those are some of, of, of the, the, the means by which the recommendations uh, issue would have sought not only to preserve the, the, the historic railway uh, in terms of it, its path, but to preserve the, 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 the rights of access use uh, since those areas or that line will have been used um, for as an access in many, in a number of, of locations along that portion of, of, the, of the sub area. So, you know, so I think that that particular question uh, can, can be covered uh, within the context of at least three different policy documents for the, for the, for the other. Hope that answers the question. Thank you very much, Fabian. Uh, as you know, Fabian is a coastal planner and um, we have a wide variety of skills at the unit. We have marine biologists, um, coastal engineers, coastal planners, a wide variety of skills um, across the spectrum at the unit. Let me um, go to another question. And this relates to the boundary of the coastal zone management area. Someone has acknowledged that they understand the methodology for defining the boundary of the area. However, is in this person's experience, the use of an imaginary line rather than geographic boundaries will pose problems for law enforcement. Can that be reconsidered? Um, Director, we have been having discussions about that um, uh, most recently. Can you give us an explanation on which, which of the two is best suited for us at the moment? Director? The, uh, I don't know how to, 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 to approach this. I think the, <clears throat> the position that we've always taken is that the point of reference for the line has to remain um, accessible and, and easily recognizable. The, the difficulty that you have in, in terms of fixing the line is that once you fix the line, whether accretion or erosion occurs, as, as in the land grows or, or it, it gets cut back, the markers are still going to be in place for the duration of time for which the line has been designated, right? Whereas we're talking about the high watermark line, right? No, we're talking about the boundary of the coastal zone management area. Which is, oh, that's just as similar. I think the, the issue that we have with that is, is somewhat similar as well. Um, the use of hard features uh, in the past when we did try to, to define the space proved very difficult for us in terms of its applicability because some persons felt that, especially on the East Coast, the, the line went too far inland because we were following the main coastal road uh, in that context, which was shown by Jonathan. Um, and therefore, a more effective line drawn based on the, um, the storm surge scenarios and the other hazards that we've identified might be more applicable. In terms of having to define that line, it's going to become essential along the way to maybe have some level of, of markers or monuments, if we're going to do it, to, to make it effective. And we're looking to see how that approach can now be taken. Failing that, um, as, in, as in past meetings, a suggestion was made that you may have to zoom into sections of the, of the shoreline using something like a, a satellite map or Google Earth, and then have a clear image with, with the positioning as to where the line is so that people will be able to recognize and identify uh, key strategic markers on the ground for, for points of reference. It's still um, up in the air right now, but th the reality is, is that under the legislation, both this existing Coastal Zone Management Act that we currently have, as well as the new uh, Coastal Zone Management Act that is in draft form that we're working on with the Chief Parliamentary Council, 
the coastal zone management area has to be defined in order to enact the plan. And that is why we want to make sure that we have a boundary that can be defined. Um, thanks to IH Cantabra, we've been able to define that boundary quite accurately uh, using geo coordinates. And that has worked uh, somewhat well, but physically to visualize the line is, is somewhat a bit of a task that we're trying to look at to see how it can be uh, implemented on the ground for the future. But once the legislation is accepted and passed, the coordinate system is still going to be the, the mechanism for use in, in defining the boundary. Um, thank you, Dr. Bruce. And let me add that we were advised that the coordinate system is the way to go. And we were pointed at other legislation who also use the coordinate system, particularly on the marine side, because obviously there's nothing there, you know, no features on the marine side for 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 us to, to define the boundary, but we were advised to use the coordinate system. I mean, we've been in constant discussion with the CPC um, uh, all along the way. And if it is that we will have to have a, um, a line on the ground, perhaps we can use the monuments as Dr. Brewster was saying, to put those in place so people will know if they are in or if they're out of the coastal zone management area. Um, I hope I've answered your question again. Please let me Alison, know. I would, I would uh, also like to add something. Sure. Uh, good night. Uh, my name is Ramon Roach. I'm the Coastal Information Systems Manager. So as Dr. Brewster uh, was alluding to, we, we, can, we can use the technology we have available to, to help us to visualize where the line falls in relation to other people's, to people's property or to different landmarks. Um, and that that visualization we've made available um, once the uh, coordinates have been finalized, that visualization we've made available to the public uh, via an online means, or if you want to look at hard copy maps that are, could be um, located in our office. Um, because there's the, 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 there's the representation of the boundary in law, which would be by coordinates. But for ease of use on a daily basis, um, people will have, it will be necessary to have a visual representation of that boundary that people can refer to. And we have technological means to accomplish this. And it, 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 will, it will make it um, even easier to understand where your, if your property falls, you know, on one side or the other along uh, the coastal management area boundary versus having to necessarily locate a monument somewhere and then see if where the next monument lies and whether your property falls in between those. If you can view it on a, on a map like Google Earth or Google Maps, it'll be a lot easier for you to really see whether your property falls within the boundary. So we can use the technology we have available to make that visualization of where the property lies a little bit more easy. Thank you. Alison, you're muted. Alison, yes. you're muted. Okay. Another question is, was there legal work done to clarify the public use of the area of land near to the high water mark? And also clarification of how close fence lines might be placed? Wow, that's a, that's a good question. I'll, I'll toss that over to Fabian. Fabian is in the field on a, on a regular basis, more than uh, some of us. So Fabian, can you provide an answer to this question? Yes, I again. Um, in terms of fence lines, um, we believe that in terms of the setback policies in place, the there was a standing policy in terms of setbacks generally before, in terms of 10 meter setback and stuff like that. Um, but we're talking about going forward. We're talking about the improvement as it relates to accountability for risk. Okay. So that you can imagine going by what you had as a previous minimum labor setback, I, I use the word minimum deliberately. 
of let's say 10 meters that would have existed before as a standard recommendation. And you have an area that's a sub area three, where you can have the white silica sand beaches as we, as we know very well. And you can immediately see that a setback such as that would not be practical in the sense of, 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 of protecting the, the natural landscape in terms of a natural heritage conservation area. And it would not be necessarily in keeping with, with, with lateral access issues along there. And we note that there are segments of the, that area of coastline that are dynamically stable. And in definition, if my memory serves you correctly, can include large swings, well stable rain systems pass. You can have a seasonal variation of beach width that can swing quite widely. So therefore it means that in those areas that are pretty much developed already, you the the the, the, the it's quite easy. Um, areas of Caha Wash, you can almost see um, a fence line in place. Um, seaward of the fences, you can have dense coastal vegetation, um, which would sit on low sand dunes. And seaward encroachment of fences beyond those points would therefore mean then removal of coastal vegetation uh, potential damage or even removal of those dunes. So therefore the practicality in, in, in making a kind of standard recommendation, what we do when we have an application, we visit the site. This is very important. This is key, okay? And the visiting of the site, allows us to see the physical characteristics of the site, to examine the natural resources that exist there, and then we supplement the information we gather from the site with the intent as outlined in the policies of the plan. And in doing so, we make recommendations to the chief town plan, which seeks to stay true to the national intent of preserving that area of coastline in keeping with the policies as it relates to natural heritage conservation area and in keeping with the policies in place as it relates to the retaining as a national park, okay? And this is important because we wouldn't necessarily want and assure that there's nobody in this forum that would agree that you want policies in place that result in this coastal segment looking like the west coast and the south coast of Barbados. All right. So I hope I answered that question. Thank you. You're welcome, Fabian. Uh, Andy, to let, let me add to, to that one is that there we didn't do any legal work. The mandate for the unit is not uh, does not um, embrace that at all in terms of the uh, legal work for the high water mark at all. Um, as Fabian said, we only um, make our recommendations to the chief town planner, but uh, the Ministry of Housing is also a part of this in terms of ownership of, of beach land and what can, can be done with uh, beach land near the high water mark. So no legal work was done in this respect. I have a question. Does the updated policy covered improved measures of how wastewater discharge from new development should be managed or treated prior to the final disposal through absorption wells Given the close proximity to the marine environment and government's push of the blue economy, can one of you on the panel answer this question for um, the participants? Um, if I may. We... Sure, Fabian. 
the, the, we we have standard policy, and I think in terms of when you look at legislation or legislation, you look at the 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 Marine Pollution Control Act and the work of the Environmental Protection Department in terms of uh, protecting our or marine environments from land-based sources of marine pollution, which includes pollution. And the last time we visited the EPD, Environment Protection Department, they actually have these little booklets uh, for the, that. I'm not sure if they're still available, but they outline um, the policies and strategies in place um, based on zoned areas. Uh, in terms of the use of suck well, septic tanks, soakaways, et cetera, and they even have um, st structural diagrams in terms of how these things are can be erected in terms of these plans, schematic plans, et cetera. And this brings to focus the, 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 the cooperation or the relationship between the Coastal Zone Manager Unit, its integrated coastal management plan, its legislation, and sister agencies like the Environmental Protection Department um, with, with, with a mandate also, it's, it's mandate also resides in the realm of coastal zone management. And there will be made recommendations um, to the chief town planner in terms of whether a development should have an on-site sewage treatment uh, facility, especially for large um, high occupancy developments. Um, for the smaller type of developments, um, sometimes people, many people submit the location of sock wells on the seaward side of the property, property meters away from the high water mark. And we often prefer that those um, wells be repositioned on the plants to the more landward extent of the property for a few reasons. One, the water table can be high in a lot of these areas, okay? So therefore the well can, you dig a well that's inherently filled with water from the get-go. Two, the, the farther back you are from the sea, um, technically, the, 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 the greater distance that this material can travel on ground that come up on our reefs. And three, uh, many instances, people actually have proposed to have septic tanks with overflow to suck wells. And by having these septic tanks on the more lowered extent of your property, it means when it comes to maintenance, pump off, et cetera, the septic trucks can access that infrastructure uh, with ease. Okay, so those are the type of policies that we have um, for quite a number of years now um, been trying to institute in terms of our recommendations and the Environmental Protection Department in terms of their the role that they put, they make sure the, 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 the proper functioning of, of things like on-site sewage treatment plants and stuff to do the, the inspection of these type of facilities, okay? And um, where there is access to sewer pipelines, like certain areas between Bridgetown and on the south coast of Barbados, naturally, the recommendation would be to, to connect to that existing sewer pipeline. Um, so that the sewage wastewater uh, wastewater can be directed to the sewage treatment plant for the necessary treatment and disposal. Uh, hi, good night, everybody. Uh, this is Black Director here, just to add to Fabian's uh, point. If I am not mistaken, that there was recently a, a groundwater protection policy as well. Antonio, and we can't hear you well. Sorry, I said that as far as I'm aware, you can hear me now? As far as I'm it's aware, a little better. Yes, as far as I'm aware, there was a groundwater protection policy recently as well. Mm -hmm. um, and that spoke to um, policies that dealt with the coastal zone as well. Mm -hmm. So that there, there's, there's that additional 
just going to plug this in. I just want to get a quick. Thanks, um, uh, Fabian and Antonia. I have a further question, and it's for a marine biologist. What are the resources, the offshore resources, that are within this particular coastal zone um, in this particular uh, sub area? I think that is Richard. Oh, sorry, yes, should I identify myself? My name is Richard Suku. I'm a marine biologist here. Can't hear you well, Richard. Ready? Hello? I can hear you better now. Okay, right. So my name is Richard Suku. I'm a marine biologist here at Coastal. Um, so with regards to- Still low. Um, is it any better now? Slightly. Okay, I haven't changed anything, just the angle. Um, so, I guess what, what, with, the, with regards to the question, um, the resources within this area, uh, generally within the unit, our focus has primarily been on the, on the coral reefs, uh, coral reef habitats, which are primarily found on our west and southwest coasts, um, and also along the southeast portion as well. Within this area, we do not have um, any significant reef, reef habitats. Uh, this is because of the of the high turbidity that we experience in, in this area, um, with, with primarily with the due to the geology of the of the of the location, we don't have um, much in terms of the um, significant benthic habitats. Um, I imagine what and the plan will the plan actually speaks to um, the biological resources in this area. It, it often speaks more to the fisheries resources. Um, so those are probably the most important ones that we speak to um, in the plan. So I think that is probably the best way to approach that question. All right. Um, thank you very much, Richard. No problem. Um, someone asked if the plan will be used to amend the NCC's act as well. Uh, I don't think... Uh, Based on the plan that we have, I don't think there are any necessary amendments which we envisage for the NCC Act in this plan. Uh, anyone else would like to um, answer this question as well? Uh, as it stands right now, Alison, I don't think there are any real plans for any any aspects of the amendment to the NCC Act. And the NCC still remains uh, retains responsibility for the management of beaches and the maintenance and upkeep of beaches, parks, and open spaces. And that in essence is what it will do. When you, when you look at some of the guidance uh, policies being identified, it shows that there may be a stronger need for, for linkage with NCC and CZMU and some activities, which may extend to things like um, sand dune, revegetation, and, and restoration. It may also include aspects of uh, development of more attuned beach management initiatives for, for this section of the coastline. Uh, and, and that is the sort of activity that we would have to work with NCC with. But the responsibility for maintenance and upkeep of beaches will still fall to NCC. It must also be remembered that NCC, even though they have responsibility for the maintenance of beaches, really and truly focus on the maintenance of public beaches and public open spaces. They don't actually cover all the beaches in Barbados um, in, in, in that respect. So once the government has crown lands associated with the beach properties and, and, and the coastal space generally, those are the areas that NCC will focus on in terms of their maintenance and management requirements, and that will still be continuing into the future. Thank you, Dr. Brewster. Dr. Aline, you um, wanted to interject at this point. Yes, I, I was just going to follow up on the, the whole issue of um, our marine space and, and the impact of waste and waste being one of the biggest threats to our coastal assets and resources. And I, 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 Fabian is explaining how we have ca we capture development and new development through col collaboration with other agencies. My question was, was just to get clarity for the general public, how do we deal with not, nothing to do with development now, but general behaviors because the, the waste is still impacting on the resources that the, the unit is trying to protect. Is there any collaborative effort to deal with public education or awareness to deal with that whole waste 
management process and also to get an insight into the relationship between the marine spatial plan that I think was alluded to in another meeting going forward, what relationship they have with the coastal zone, integrated coastal zone management plan, just those two things. Um, we, I think in terms of looking at it, you, you would have mentioned um, behaviors and you have initiatives like uh, roof the reef, um, bridge the reef, et cetera. You know, we're looking at things at the household level, what can be done. And of course, you know, it, it requires one, a lot of public education. And you know that you can disseminate a lot of information, but then there's that challenge in, in getting people to internalize the information that you would have sought to avoid into behavioral change. And then two, you have to have the mechanisms and infrastructure in place, some things to facilitate what you want. Uh, we know from the EBA ecosystem-based studies that was done previously under the project that the water quality um, in our near shores that res result in a lot of the poor coral reef health, et cetera, is as a primarily as a consequence of, of, of sewage and, um, and, and, and storm water runoff, okay? So it means then that from a management perspective at the national level, you have to have a national mechanism of dealing, of addressing the issue of treatment and disposal of, of sewage. And that has also to be coupled with storm water management, a drainage issue, okay? In terms of minimizing opportunities of that poor quality water entering our near shore, um, this, and, and, and increasing the nutrient content, et cetera, that is resulting in the demise of, of, of the habitats, the marine habitats that we have. So while we know, we have a very good idea of what is required, the, but the behaviors of the public, in terms of littering and stuff like that, has to be assisted by national uh, initiatives to deal with those big uh, countrywide issues, uh, being um, sewage and wastewater. And of course, you know, some funny suck wells is brown water discharged on, on, onto our reefs as well. So it, while it is from an academic perspective, it may seem easy from a management and, and probably that higher level perspective, a financial perspective, because you need money to do these things and to build these plants and, and treatment. You need to finance these, these initiatives to make this a reality, to make it happen. Um, it can be quite difficult at the same time. Um, hence, this is why for years now, we probably know the, the, the problems, but sometimes the, the actual solution may not be immediately in your grasp. If not, I think we would actually have these things implemented. Uh, uh, I know we already, we, we, we saw the issues and challenges with the South Coast Swiss project, um, the chaos, the complaints, you know, and, 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 but we know what, that a lot of sewage now in its raw state wouldn't necessarily go um, onto, onto the recent that vicinity. Um, and, and hopefully we can get treatment to a tertiary level uh, somewhere in the distant future, uh, financing permitted and, and will permitting. Um, but I don't think, you know, we would like to think it's easy, but, but, but history being a teacher and, and knowing what we know for how many years now we've been hearing about this in the classroom, um, and it still isn't a reality yet. Um, that fantastic, perfect picture, it suggests that it's a much more difficult task 
to achieve than we would probably like to believe. Thank you. I think that what Fabian okay. also is, is alluding to is the fact that generally nutrient loading within the groundwater system is, is one of our biggest problem on, on reefs generally, okay? Yeah. Um, the, the aspects that speak more or less to direct sewage pollution is, is, is not as repeat as what people would think, but it's really and truly high nutrient loading coming from groundwater seepage. And as I keep saying all the time, all water runs to the sea. All water runs to the coast. It runs to the sea, both above land and below land. So if you live in St. Thomas, St. George, certain parts of St. Philip, along the crest in Hillaby, um, once you have wastewater treatment facilities at your home, whether it be septic tanks, soakaways, or whatever, everything goes to ground. When it gets to the ground, it finds the underground streams and, and water courses and natural percolation mechanisms to flow and then through gravity, it all flows downhill to the coast. That is where the real loading and nutrient issues come from. So we as coastal, when we monitor, we monitor water quality from a ecosystem perspective. And I think the, the reality with that is that when we look at high nutrient loading, whether it be from uh, agrochemical presence, sometimes where you have large uh, agriculture, agriculture fertilizer applications, uh, getting into the groundwater and making its way, or if you have areas of high urban development along the coastline and uh, stretching inland as well, you have a situation where it's this groundwater that is making its way to the coast. It makes its way to the coastal lens, which is what Fabian was talking about in terms of when we have people trying to place suck wells on the coast and you know that when you dig five feet, you hit water because there's a high water table there already, you have to look to relocate those suck wells much further uh, landward on your property so that you may have at least some level of time to allow for the, the accumulated effluent to slowly discharge um, through the, the coastal lens um, as it's making its way out to sea. So what we're really truly focused on is trying to find a way to see how best we can improve the quality of the water quality entering the near shore environment. Environmental Protection Department monitors the water quality from a public health perspective. Okay, so they're looking at um, the situation where you can get a worst case scenario that could result in people getting sick. Um, and, and, and therefore you have that consideration, especially when it comes to bacteriological contamination versus nutrient loading, which is what we are really focused on and the issues of cause for concern there. I think in doing that, then you have to then be able to address how best we can address those matters. Now, when we had the, the, old, the older groundwater zoning policy, when everything was focused on trying to ensure you had a 300 day travel time for a particle of water, from the boundary, the external boundary of the zone one uh, area to reach the, the pump head well. Um, the new zone one, the new groundwater policy has slightly reduced those actual um, boundary areas, but provided stringent conditions now in terms of how developments may take place on the fringes of those new zone one boundaries. So, as Antonio was talking about, the new groundwater policy is something that as it rolls out is going to become more and more stringent. And in doing that, actually, they've addressed the developments, especially along the coastal fringe, to ensure that there is uh, a more enforceable method of treatment of wastewater from, from urban development and from residential development along the coastline, which previously did not exist in the former groundwater zoning policies. Um, good night again. Can you hear me? Probably good night again. Just want to add one last thing to this um, because we're, we're dealing with a lot with the wrong one. But I just want to just chime in here quickly in terms of what happens on the land. And, uh, the Ministry of Environment at the time where we were housed along the drainage, they had uh, looked at some initiatives in terms of reducing basically sediment loading or how much, I put it in simple terms. How much, how much did the sediment go into the sea? Um, by looking at retention ponds and so on inland, the trade reduced so much, how much of that runoff went into the water. We also um, did a bit of work with what was the solid waste project unit as a unit. 
we used to do a lot of stuff with them in terms of recycling and um, going to their fairs and uh, trying to explain to people you know, how much better it is to recycle and use rather than throw things in cuddies and stuff like that end up in the marine environment. So we, we did some, also the Ministry of Environment, they had a, did a gully study as well. And it was supposed to be a, a program for management of the gullies and again, they cannot not dispose of the place in the gullies and so on, getting into water. And of course, I suspect, I think the EPD, Environment, Environment, Environment Protection Department, uh, inland, I, they, look, they have already implemented um, things like certain pesticides and so on not to be used in agriculture here because that of course makes it way up into the ground as well as over the over the ground and into the environment. So there are quite a few things uh, that were going on and still going on and uh, in terms of trying to look at this issue of, of pollution and garbage and, 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 and the green environment. Thank you. Thank you, Antonio. I have some clarifications here from one of our um, attendees. Um, he, uh, this person advised the groundwater protection policy 2020 sets the policies and actions for the divine, defined zones in the groundwater protection 2020. The coastal zone is defined in the groundwater protection policy as a recharge zone. Suck wells under the new policy will no longer be the sole means of treatment of sewage. Developers will be required to treat sewage prior to discharge to the Suckwell. Government has also approved a water reuse policy with specific standards for water reuse to encourage water reuse at larger facilities. And thank you very, very much for that, uh, for that clarification. Someone has asked, reference was made to the National Park Management Plan for this area. Is this available to the public? Where can it be sourced? Okay, uh, as part of the uh, 1996 to 19 to 2000, I think it was, uh, Environmental Management and Land Use Project, um, which was run through the Ministry of Environment. There, there were three plans that were done simultaneously. It was the physical development plan, the coastal zone management plan, and the national park plan. The national park plan was executed by the Natural Heritage Department. And that plan, although still in draft form, similar to how the, the coastal zone management plan was in draft form, uh, the last plan that we had, it was supposed to be available for review uh, at the office at the Natural Heritage Department. So I think that you could contact uh, the director there if anybody wants to have a read of the plan. I don't think it was ever made a public document per se because similar procedures had to be followed as, as what we are doing now in our plan. But it was a subsidiary to the PDP at the time mm -hmm. and therefore constituted a a reference document similar to how uh, the Coastal Zone Management Plan provides guided reference to the PDP. But the um, uh, attendees can also look to Section 11 of the of the former P the PDP 2003, the National Park Plan, and Section A04 in the 2017 PDP, the System of Parks and Open Spaces, spaces. as well. Agreed. If you want Agreed. further guidance on the management and land use within the national park as well. Um, uh, another issue with regard to waste, it says the beaches in this area are primarily impacted by maritime solid waste deposited on the beaches. The problem is that there's no systematic beach cleaning effort for this sub area. And we do acknowledge, and we do acknowledge that. Um, uh, I think the, the, the draft plan, um, I think one of the tables there mm -hmm. um, makes a recommendation in terms of an ASHA item uh, to have a beach management uh, plan. And, obviously, and that would require uh, collaboration with the 
National Conservation Commission. Um, as the director uh, correctly pointed out, uh, uh, they have legal responsibility for the maintenance and the keep management of the beaches of Barbados. Uh, but just to add a little extra, I think that the human resource complement that the, that the commission will have, they normally would deploy their human resources in terms of cleaning of beaches um, to the more heavily used beaches on the west, the south coast, and to the Barclays Park region, which would naturally be a focal point um, for people, locals, and, and visitors, tourists to the island to, to go congregate and recreate. Um, the, 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 the litter that would normally be found on those more isolated, less frequently trafficked areas of coastline, uh, like down behind Morgan Lewis and, and, uh, and, 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 and lakes and so on and so forth, um, that would be more occupied by hikers, etc. A lot of that is marine debris, which will come from other shores, and the currents will bring it um, to our beaches here, particularly on the eastern side of the island. And what is now becoming a more traditional activity in terms of uh, World International Ocean Cleanup Day and so on and so forth, uh, beach cleanups uh, would have been arranged, uh, some by NCC, some by the Environmental Protection Department, the Coastal Zone Mass Unit would have had a share of beach cleanup and underwater cleanups in the past. And then you will have other groups, corporate entities looking to do their corporate responsibility, um, thing to maintain the environment, but take the opportunity to get their staff, their families and, 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 and friends of the organizations to go and to cooperate and clean these areas. So it may not necessarily, uh, at first glance, it may appear that that government's attention to these areas of coastline may be lacking. But on the flip side, that void um, being filled to some extent by the, the general public, uh, by more private sector organizations, it, it seems to have catalyzed that sense of, 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 of allegiance and, and the need to take care of, of the environment, the coastal environment outside the realms of the public service. And I think that is a good thing, okay? And if, if more Barbadians, if more people who love our coast took that initiative and took ownership of it, in a sense, in terms of it's being part of their natural heritage, and I'm using that word heritage deliberately here, in, in, uh, given the era that it's in, it means then that the, the, the message that this, that is our coastline, and you said again, our coastline um, is getting through, and that, and that people are buying in to that belief system, and that cooperation of the general wider public, the wider Barbadian society, the wider corporate Barbados, in joining hands with the National Conservation Commission, the Coastal Zone Management Unit, and all other government agencies involved in the management of our coastline, it means that something good is happening, and I can only wish that it grows. Thank you. Thank you, Fabian. I don't see any more, any more questions or comments from our participants here tonight. I would like to turn over to the uh, deputy director who will give the vote of thanks. But after the vote of thanks, please don't leave. There's an exit poll that we would like you to take um, before you go and we encourage you to do that. It was my pleasure to serve you here tonight again and I'm certain the Coastal Zone Management Unit and the team from Cantabria, we fully embrace your comments and your questions. 
and we thank you for submitting them. We look forward to seeing you at the next uh, meeting, which is on Thursday night at the same 6 p.m., where we will look at the choice to North Point of Barbados. So, Antonio, please give the vote of thanks. Okay, good night, everybody. Once again, we really like to thank you all for coming out and participating in the public inquiry process for this sub area, concept based the choice. And I really hope that the information that you receive gives you a better understanding and appreciation for how the ICZ and plan really seeks to aid in the sustainable development of your sub area, both all environmentally, socially, and economically. If you have any further inquiries, though, you could actually send them to us through our website at www.coastal.gov.bb or through our WhatsApp number, 2563173. I would like to wish you a good night. Again, I ask you to enjoy the rest of your evening safely, but please don't forget the exit poll. Uh, please uh, try and give us a answers on that as well. Thank you very much and good night. Thank you. Don't forget the exit poll. I, I look forward to seeing you on Thursday evenings, 6 p.m. Thank you very much.